thank you all for being here today to talk about interviewing and hiring, which is an unsexy topic, but really important. So I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm, uh, t together, we're going to be penetration testing the standard developer job interview. Uh, so who here is involved with the hiring process at their current company? So doing some interviews and hiring, that seems like about 50-50. Um, how many folks can think of an engineer that they know that would not do well in their company's current interview process without you vouching for them? Most folks. Uh, what about the opposite? Someone that you've worked with or you know uh, that would do very well at your interview but maybe isn't the best person on your team? <laughs> few, few fewer hands, that's good. So today we're mostly going to be talking about that second category, the people that maybe do better on your interview than maybe they should um, if, you're, if your goal is to predict success. That's called a false positive for any science nerds <laughs> around there. Uh, so who am I? I spent the last 10 years as he head of engineering at a startup in Indianapolis called PolicyStat. I did a lot of hiring and made a lot of mistakes, um, and I learned things the hard way. So five years ago, um, I was giving an on-site interview, and it was going awesome. I was feeling really good because this was an important position uh, for the team. And we were like geeking out about Linux and our first distribution. And I was, he ran a home server. I was like, yes, this is it. Um, and we looked at some old work, and he sounded really smart. And I was, I was really happy. Fast forward nine months later, I was much less happy. I felt very different. Um, I found out that he was really good at building rapport and talking and was a genuinely nice guy. Uh, but he was not the right person for the role I hired for. I made that mistake. That's my fault. And because of that, we had a year hole in our product roadmap, and I, I didn't want to feel that way again. So over the last five years, I've tried to be less and less bad at hiring. That's kind of my journey. In interviews. So we're going to do this in three parts. The first part, we're going to talk about stories and vulnerabilities, how, how we can attack the interview. In the second part, we're actually going to walk through the standard interview and talk about how we can attack each piece and like really concrete advice. In the third part, we're going to get uh, more optimistic and talk about how we can defend against these attacks in our interview process. So part one, uh, in penetration testing, um, this is a tool, a term borrowed from computer security where you attack a system in order to learn how to defend it. Um, so we're going to attack the interview process. And the good and bad news, it's incredibly vulnerable. Um, so the main vulnerabilities we're going to be exploiting today are heuristics. Heuristic is just a fancy way of saying rule of thumb, uh, a quick guideline. Our brains are really, really good at heuristics. Heuristics are fast. You can do them instantly. You don't have to think. You don't have to, like that feeling you get whenever you have to, someone makes you do math, where you're like, oh, now I have to add these numbers in my head. And you have to like slow down. Uh, that's not a heuristic. That's the hard part. Heuristics are fast, and they feel intuitive, and they're often wrong. The wrong case, that's what we're going to attack. Um, before, we, let's, let's set our goal of the hiring process. So as the hiring team, my favorite definition of a goal of hiring is to add the person that will create the best team. Um, I think that's an important distinction to make versus hire the best person, which is another common definition of, of hiring. And the analogy I like to use here is, uh, forgive the sports analogy, if you're, if you're building a soccer team and the four best players available are all goalies, you probably don't want to hire four goalies in your soccer team. So in soccer, you can only have one goalie, maybe you have a backup. You don't need four. Um, so our goal in hiring is to build the best team, which means diversity of skills and backgrounds and, and working well together. So that's, that's, that's our goal here. This, uh, we're all going to do this together. I'm going to read out loud. A bat and a ball costs $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? All right, everyone answer it in your head. Just a little time. OK, so who? thinks it's 10 cents. So 80% of people, when given this question, answer 10 cents. 10 cents is simple, intuitive, and completely wrong. Does someone want to explain why 10 cents is wrong? Because it's 5 cents is wrong. That's 5 cents is the right answer. That's a good way to do it. So it, it, if it was 10 cents, we know that if it was a dollar more, that'd be a dollar 10 plus 10. It's a dollar 10. Um, so this is this is an example of kind of a, a heuristic that our brain uses um, that is wrong. Let's do another one. 
So this is, this is obviously a spiral, right? You look at it, it's spiraling towards the middle. It's not. So look closely. These, these are actually concentric circles. So this is a, this is a heuristic uh, vulnerability in our visual system in particular. So if you try to follow it around, your eyes kind of slide off. It's really weird. You have to kind of block it with your hand. Um, but in nature, there are not things like this. You're not like walking on the savanna or in the jungle and all of a sudden this thing's around. So it's obvious why we have this bug. The goal of our vision system is not be to 100% correct. Our, our goal is to, to be adaptive, to make better decisions. And it's OK that we're bad at this. The problem is now we're making a lot of decisions that we're not, uh, uh, that we're not in the savanna, in the jungle. And that's, that's why we're so vulnerable. Or we're different, right? I mean, I, I saw several of you get the first thing right. So you are maybe a little bit different. Uh, the good news is, if you think you're completely different, you're going to be really easy to attack tonight, so, or this morning. So we'll, we'll go forward. Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice. And she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Which is more probable? Linda is a librarian. Linda is a librarian and is active in the feminist movement. I'll give her one a sec on. So we've got a bunch of engineers, so we can like, <laughs> so we can stop and be like, wait a minute, this is a superset of the other thing. This is another one where about 80% of people say two. And people, what? I'm sorry. Um, so the, uh, I mean, we've all thought about this a little bit. So Linda's librarian is a superset of Linda, Linda the feminist librarian, but most people. Can really eat, they can imagine Linda with that, like holding up the picket sign and like marching. Like that's a very salient story. Uh, so that's the intuitive answer that most people give to this problem. Let's do one a little bit more zoomed into hiring. Um, so these are two resumes with the same ex experience, same project. The only difference is on the left you've got some specific numbers which seem good, right? We like numbers. Uh, you also have an extra math degree. That's like, that's like two or three years of extra school this person on the left has. On the right, um, this person is basically the same, except they use back action verbs to describe their project. So this is a real example. If someone sent this out and got data back, who do we think got more callbacks? Who thinks the right got more callbacks? Got a few hands. The right gets twice as many callbacks in reality, twice as many people think that they want to interview that person on the right, even though it's actually the same person, just a slightly different resume, and with less school. How crazy is that? Go to school for two or three more years, or like tweak some wording on a one bullet point on your resume. <laughs> it is nuts. Um, so uh, in resumes that use action verbs to start their stories get twice as many callbacks. Uh, adding a second degree gets you between 20 and 40, uh, depending on the situation. The crazy thing is, if you send your resume on Monday morning, you get five times the callbacks compared to Friday afternoon. So don't go to school, just time your resume sending better. That's the, <laughs> that's the lesson. So th there are lots of vulnerabilities like this. And if we find the edges of the process, we can, we can make a big impact on our callback without changing a person. Um, so this is our attack vector t uh, today. It's stories. So Linda, the feminist librarian, that's the one that we could imagine really quick. Um, the action verb, that tells a better story. It's easy for us to imagine someone uh, developed versus like, uh, I think developed was in there in the middle, but I got to do too much work cognitively, so it's hard for me to tell the story. Um, as an att attacker, our job is to implant stories into the mind of the interviewer. That's how we get on to the next step. It's, it's kind of an example of the availability heuristic. Um, it's, it's easier to, to think of these things. Um, on the left, we see an fMRI of someone processing a list of information, which is what most resumes read like. On the right, we have someone processing a story. The whole brain is lit up. Like stories, this, we want to create that second image. That's, that's what we want to create with all of our steps in the interview. That's, it it uh, involves the visual system, the, auditory system, stories are way more powerful uh, tools. Um, just an example of how powerful stories are. Uh, 
who has heard of like the memory champions, the people that just do crazy feats of memory? Yes, actually, that's that's quite a lot. So the the current record is around 1,900 uh, playing cards, like your normal 52 deck of cards. 1,900 of these memorized an hour and then recalled perfectly. 1,900 in an hour. That is insane. The way those people do that is not some crazy, you know, they're not freaks of nature. They build stories. They create cards that are characters that perform actions and chain along. Our brains are really, really good at this. Like it's, it's like the native compression format for the human mind. Stories are powerful. All right, so now we're gonna use stories to attack. Start with the resume. You wanna be the feminist librarian with your resume. You wanna start with action verbs. Um, you need to tell a story. Um, you, distinct action verbs are, and you've, you've probably heard the action verb thing from your college placement and all the HR folks. And if you're like me, you were skeptical, but this, this stuff really works. Um, the way to test your bullet points on your resume as an attacker is to have a friend read your bullet point and then tell you the story, like add a bunch of words to tell you the story. You will likely find that they'll struggle. You'll find that you missed, you left out parts that allows them to tell the story. Um, and that's the time you need to go back and rewrite it. And we'll talk about exactly the definition of a story in a second. Um, and that second is now. Uh, this is our, these are our acceptance tests for stories. Right? These are the criteria that if we want to create that lit up brain, we need to meet these criteria. Um, so at, from bottom to top, the first is, does it have a where and when? And this is really important. I realized until, uh, these, this is mostly from a book called Selling with a Story that's actually really good, not necessarily about sales, just about communicating with other humans, which we all do as engineers. Um, I read, from reading that book, I realized I almost never tell a story because I never give a win, which is crucial to activating your brain. It's like, when does this happen? That puts us into like reflective story brain mode. Um, the next bit is, does it have a context? You need to have a problem or an opportunity. If you just do something and there was no problem before you did something, that is the most boring story in the world. It's like, I went to work and crushed it. Great story. That's, <laughs> thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, there, then there has to be a conflict, which is where you take action to resolve that problem opportunity. That's you doing something. That's that action verb that we're gonna start with. Um, and then was a resolution. It's kind of a story without this. It's just kind of like a tease story that's like you don't want to do. You want to you tell what good thing happened as a result. And then uh, stories are fundamentally emotional. That's, that's why that memory trick works, because we're, we're like tapping into emotions we feel about these stories. And if, you, if you're really good at this, you can also design a story that has like suspense and surprise and all these other things. I'm not good at that, so uh, the book will tell you how to, how to take a story and run it through a process to turn it from a bad story to a good story if you're interested. So these are our acceptance tests. And when I say story, I mean a thing that passes all of these acceptance tests. So phone screen. Now that we've started with action verbs and stories on our resume, it's time to translate that to the phone screen. So phone screens are super artificial. They know very little about you. They're making snap judgments. Um, they often don't have any kind of rubric. It's just how they feel after you're done. That means they're so vulnerable to these, uh, these story manipulations. Uh, if you tell a good story, you can swing things wildly one way or the other. Um, the story you want to implant is you, you on their team making their day easier. That's the, like, the easiest snap judgment. You want to be the teammate that they want, uh, they want to work with. So the easiest ways you can implant that, um, start with confidence. It's, it's, it's the greatest hack. Right, you con men. The con and con in con man is confidence man. Like this is the the hack to get into human emotions. Um, some ways to project confidence. Confidence. It's it's mostly your voice, um, but there's also some specific techniques. One is to ask questions of questions. Someone asks you a question, ask a clar clarifying question. For some reason, that signals you being very confident. I don't really know why. If anyone else knows why, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, the other thing you can do is the stall. This is the Hmm, good question. Just use that once. Just use that once in an interview on the hardest question. You sound smart. You have more time to think of your answer, and it makes you feel more confident. Because the alternative is someone that just kind of rushes into the, the answer because they're feeling the pressure. So that taking time signals confidence. Excitement. This is another one that, that, that um, 
I talk to a lot of HR fo folks, a lot of engineering leaders. They're trying to get at excitement. They want people that are going to be excited at the job. And on the phone screen, all they know is your voice. So that's the best signal you have. Do jumping jacks before your phone screen. Like get your blood moving. It's silly, but it works. Um, the other thing you want to do is look, is smile while you're talking. That signals excitement. Um, they've done research, like double blind research. People can tell the difference in your voice based on your smile versus not smile. And if you if you suck at this, you're not a normal smiler. Uh, remember, this is a this is a, a job interview that's artificial. You do this once, you'll get the job. Then they'll get to know you and realize you're kind of more even keel, and that's fine. A, a way to check yourself. Look at a mirror. Put your phone on like reverse so you can see your face to remind yourself to smile is kind of a hack for this. Um, asking questions. This one, most people know that you should ha ask questions in the interview. I recommend getting a stable of two or three that you can ask anyone at any time so that if you're like nervous, you, have, you haven't thought through it. My favorite is, uh, what attracted you to current job? Or what's a great day um, for you at current job? So you, you, you have a good chance of learning, um, but it also comes off as pretty thoughtful actually interested in another human, interested in the company, and you can learn useful things. Uh, and mirror this one is, if someone's talking to you and they're really excited and you're on the phone with them, you should also be really excited and match their speaking pe uh, speed. If someone's more laid back, they talk slower, they're more thoughtful, you should also slow your speech down to match it. Um, this creates some sort of crazy you know, human mind melding thing. There's, there's really cool studies on like people crossing their legs and, and mirroring and how that impacts um, a perception of another person. So we're past the phone screen. Now we're into the on-site where we're going to tell a lot of stories about ourselves. Before we do that, we're going to build a an exploitation framework for the on-site interview. All right, so this is the logo for Metasploit. Who's heard of Metasploit? All right, got some security folks in here. So Metasploit is like a, a, um, a vulnerability delivery platform thing. So you can write a vulnerability once, and then attack a bunch of machines, and then you can pair it with other things. So it's like you do work once and get to use it everywhere. We're going to do that for stories. Our our framework is going to be a bunch of is a Google Doc. Um, so we're going to we're going to figure out what are the stories, what are the, like seven stories of cool things we've done, uh, resolving conflict or solving solving hard technical problems. And we're going to write those up, and we're going to go through that acceptance criteria and make them good stories. The cool thing is you get seven good stories. You can use those seven stories to answer 7,000 different questions. Every time you get a question that's about past you, you should be looking for an excuse to tell one of these seven stories that are in your pocket. Like that's how you signal, uh, that's how you create that vision of you being that awesome coworker that gets stuff done. Um, ways to generate this, just Google common interview questions, go through them, be like, that story, that story, I'll use that story, or oh crap, I don't have a story for that. And then you do some reflection. Because it sucks to be sitting in the hot seat in an interview. You get a question, and you're like, oh, I know I've done stuff like that, but I, I can't remember where. So take the time to build this, this uh, exploitation framework with stories. That's my like number one uh, recommendation for people doing on-site, is, is take the time to do this. Oh, I should have switched to this slide. What I thought. Uh, yeah, common interview questions, match them to a story, test and practice. Ideally, test with another human. Uh, ideally, not a non-technical human. Um, they're they're better at not getting lost in the technical details and sticking to the story level, which is what where you really want to get uh, resonate with. Uh, pass all the acceptance tests. Now let's talk about take-home test. So the question that the the, uh, the the grader, the scorer, the evaluator is asking here is, does this look like my work? This is the heuristic they're using, because it's really hard to holistically evaluate a piece of engineering. It's like how much time did they spend? How senior were they? What instructions, those are really hard. We, we are really good at avoiding hard questions and asking easier questions, and this is much easier. Because most, most companies, they say it's either thumbs up or thumbs down, so it's like, how does this make me feel? Um, so the ways you can hack this is make it look like their work. If they have open source projects, look at them. See what tools they use, what unit test frameworks they use, what do they use for documentation. Learn it and use it. Spend an hour to you know, learn this. If you do nose and they do PyTest or whatever, use PyTest. It's going to create that uh, emotional resonance of like this. This person is like me. Um, if it's an untimed take-home test, plan on spending three to five x the recommended time. I've talked to a lot of people who have gotten jobs on these. Most of the people that didn't already have a leg up because they knew they knew someone, they spend much more than recommended time. So you should plan on that too. You are competing with those folks if you're not that person. Um, so you should plan to spend more time and spend that time not to expand scope, 
but to polish the snot out of that code. Do it, walk away, come back, review your own code, make it better, polish, polish, polish. That's how you get past take home tests that are untimed because other people are doing it and that's what you're compared against. Um, oh, and the last step, I, I missed the slide again. Um, you should follow up after you after you send the take home time, spend 15, 30 minutes to send a thoughtful email about your your uh, what you could have done better, what you would do with more time, and thank them for creating an exercise because it is kind of a pain to create exercises. Like that's your kind of hook in it. Oh, this person is thoughtful, right? It's 15, 20 minutes and makes a big difference in how you proceed. It's time to talk defense. Um, so the, the most important part in defense um, is to start with the end in mind. You should start by thinking through what does this candidate going to do on my team? And we all, I, I skipped this for the longest time. Um, this is the most important step. If you get this right, you can kind of stumble through the rest. Um, I recommend getting as concrete as you can, like 30, 60, 90 day outcomes. Like what are the ev what's the evidence that, that will make me believe that this person was successful? Um, because then you can reverse engineer what they need, what skills do they need to have, what experience do they need to have from what they're going to do 30, 60, 90 days out. Um, so g the bad news is we're really, we're really, we stereotype, we make biased decisions. The good news is research shows that given better information, we're, we're actually pretty reasonable. We, we throw away biases and um, unconfirmed things if we have good evidence. So this 30, 60, 90 day framework allows us to uh, tie evidence to things that are concrete. So these are just some examples. Um, I recommend getting as concrete as you can. So the number of things that you'll release to production is, is probably something you want to include there. So like this has a four, six, eight uh, pull request ramp. Your, your uh, environment might be very different. It might be code merged into the master branch, whatever it is, whatever your metric of like, yeah, I feel successful about this. Um, you can do team exercises, like do they speak up in meetings at least once? And that, that tells you, okay, I need someone that's going to uh, contradict, that's going to push back a little bit somewhere in the interview. That's a good predictor uh, of that. Um, uh, code review, doing code review, uh, things like implementation process improvement. And the nice thing here is this makes your interview better because you can kind of reverse engineer what you need to ask based on what this person can do. It's also really good for onboarding. Who here has a great onboarding program? I'm keeping my hand down. <laughs> This, like a thoughtful version of this, where you upfront have, have, have like uh, gotten the right people in the room and said, like, what does success look like? This is something you can just hand to that person the first day. And now they know what you, you're expected and they know when they need to get help. They see, like, oh man, unit tests on two pull requests. I've never really done unit testing. So that means in that first 30 days, I'm going to need coaching. And they can ask for that. Ideally, you, you see that and you, you identify the gap and say, like, you, you need to spend an hour a week pairing with with uh, Steve because he's our best TDD person. So this is, a, this is good for the interview and also good for onboarding. So that's why it's a, a double win. So resumes are lies. I, the, best, the best intern I have ever had, I rejected based on his resume and I just got lucky. I, uh, he, there was a matching thing and a bunch of stuff I went into, but he was the best intern. I've hired 15 interns and he's by far the best and I rejected him on like resume. Resumes, my number one recommendation is don't look at resumes. Find something else to do that first screen. I recommend a questionnaire. What's your heart? Something like, what's your heart? The hardest technical challenge um, uh, you worked your way through successfully? Or what's a time that you've been on a great team um, that helped each other? And what were the what was the what was a specific outcome? Something very specific. You're going to get more signal. And I also recommend limiting the the, the length. Don't let people you know submit a novel because then some people will feel compelled to submit a novel and then you'll have to read a novel, which is maybe not so good. Uh, I recommend just throwing resumes away, putting that into place. If you're in an organization where that's untenable because, you know, HR has processes and that's okay, um, uh, there's a scoring system, which is like figure out what are good things. Three plus years of Python experience, um, worked in SAS before, has done unit tests, whatever that is, and just give points. Like if we're working in SAS is two points, the other one is three points. And anyone above a point is a cutoff. You make yourself no longer vulnerability to the, vulnerable to that story heuristic where a better written bullet point totally sways you one way or the other. And if you're at a big company, the person doing this is an HR, and they need your help. 
they need instructions. Otherwise, you're going to complain about the people they're sending or not sending, so this is a way you can help them. It seems simplistic, um, and I would definitely err on the side of sending too many people past um, this point, but if you have to use resumes, that's, um, there's a lot of evidence about that kind of structured de decision making, uh, creating better outcomes. Um, so the phone screen, um, I used to, uh, I used to fly people out to do interviews after the phone screen. I thought that was pretty good. I thought I could kind of, you know, uh, really gel with someone. And then I had my first time where I flew someone out, and then we got on, uh, got in front of a computer together, and they couldn't do FizzBuzz. And this wasn't like they did it in five minutes, and I expect them to do it in three. This was like struggle with for loops and conditionals given help. Like this is not someone um, that I should have flown out. It was a waste of their time, waste of my time. Uh, I find phone screens to be very unpredictive, especially on the screen out side. So my, my recommendation is to, um, that this is, the, this is the process where you feel like you have the most information while you still have very little information. So any way you can add evidence or data to this, um, uh, the better. So on my phone screens, and what I recommend is screen out people that are jerks. So if they're a jerk during this process, they can't, they can't manage to hide that. That's a pretty good signal. Um, Screen out people that don't actually want this job. Like, hey, you know, this is, what, do you, what are you looking out of your next five years? And if they say something that is very much not in line with what they could do in the next five years there, and that, that's a hard question, and you should give people some you know, help if, and time. Don't say, hey, that's not what this job is, and see if they say, like, oh, thank you. You just saved me the next eight hours of interviewing because I thought that job was, the job posts are really bad at communicating with each other. So they don't actually want the job. They're a jerk, um, or what's my third thing? Is one of, oh, co compensation and like travel and all these things that are like hard stops, like H1B visa sponsorship if you don't do it. That's what I recommend doing with phone screens because phone screens are dangerous. Um, if you're defending, you need to ask the same questions of everyone, and I recommend those like very basic questions. Um, you should write up some examples of okay, good, but bad bad, okay, good answers. So just like, here's a quote from someone that we think, uh, as a team, we've decided this is a bad answer. Here's an example of a quote that's an okay, here's a good. And then future you will thank you because you will forget what is okay and good if you go wild before hiring. So you can kind of um, use that as like, oh, this is what okay is, and you can recalibrate it. That allows you to be consistent in your phone screens. Take home tests. So these are, I love take home tests, and I hate take home tests. There were bad, really bad, really, or I almost want to say exploitative take-home tests with unreasonable ex expectations. There are also take-home tests that are much better um, than the alternative way of gathering evidence. They let people who don't have the experience, they don't have the paper background, show that they can do the job. Um, so the way to create this, this kind of take-home test that lets people prove to you they can do stuff that maybe you don't have evidence on their resume to do, um, you want to time box the exercise. This is a little controversial, and I'd love to talk to anyone who, who feels strongly about this. Um, you have two evils. One is untimed uh, take-home tests, where people who are, you, know, you, you want to be able to hire single moms who are already employed. If you have an untimed take-home test, you are really going to uh, bias your sample away from those folks who don't have a lot of extra time. A timed take-home test means you are taking the responsibility to calibrate that test on your existing team. We are bad at estimating. Engineering's hard. You, you create this spec and say, this should take two hours, and you never test it with someone internal. What's the odds that's actually going to take two hours? Not very good. And I've done this. I've, I create, I've created a work sample, given it to my team, and like, oh, that took three times as long because I totally didn't know. So time box it. Um, I recommend starting with an existing project rather from scratch, as well, unless the, the person will be doing mostly from scratch work, which is almost nobody because it's more predictive. Um, always have two graders. So two independent graders who don't talk to each other until they re reveal their thumbs up, thumbs down answer. That's a, that, you will learn so much from that. That's like my number one. Um, because what you'll probably learn is you have inconsistent grading standards, and that will drive you towards a better solution if you just take that one step of having independent graders. So what do we want to do about this time together? So we, we can all laugh at past us with worst interview process, but I would really like to come out of this time if we think of exactly one thing. 
What's the one thing in your current interview process? Even if you're not the hiring manager, what's the one thing that you could suggest that would make your, your process um, less vulnerable to these attacks, more fair um, to candidates? I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking for about 15 seconds so everyone can think of what's the one thing in their process they think they could, they could get changed or improved. We've got a lot of smart people in this room, and if we put our efforts to it, we can, we can make our hiring processes better. We can make this a more fair uh, place for everyone in our industry. People that don't have the, the resume experience, they didn't go to the right school, but they could be your next great teammate. Like, this is the group of folks who could uh, make that a reality. And thank you all for coming uh, to my talk.